Hello, Amy. Hi. Amy, your last name is Williams. It's not y'all? No, yeah, it's shocking. I know. I know. But you, is your middle name Wynn or is that your last name? It's actually my middle name and I just kind of use it as my stage name. <laughs> yeah, my middle name is Lynn. So we have very rhyming situations. <laughs> yeah, Amy, yeah. Lynn, Kelly. Yeah. Lynn. Amy, look, <laughs> we're meant to be friends. It's true. I love it. So the reason you are on the podcast today is I've been following you for a while and I guess maybe a mutual following, but threads happened. Mm. As many know, by the time this comes out, and I'm sure threads is old news, but threads came out. And so then we're having more casual conversations on threads and someone must have asked you if you would start a podcast and you're like, that would be so boring. And I'm like, I am I'm going to find out. So come and be on my podcast. I love it. And to be fair, the podcast itself is not boring. It's just the thought of me having to weekly be like, this is what we're going to talk about. I would end up being like, my hair feels weird today. And everyone would be like, I'm not listening anymore. I would so listen to that. And that's what we're here to challenge. Like, we need different points of view. We need the, the quirkiness in the industries as well yeah. as like this creative industry is getting a lot repetitive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, here's a fresh voice. You're a Southern girl. You paint pottery. You don't paint paintings, which a lot of the people in my community paint paintings you are lesbian you have a partner is she mm -hmm. your girlfriend or your wife she is my girlfriend we've been together almost a decade though yes and yeah. so there's just like so many different elements that we can open up our minds to and that's why I was like you would be so much you're so much fun to follow on Instagram you would be oh, just as fun on a podcast however as busy business people adding one more thing to the to-do list <laughs> is just enough for us to like break so yeah Better that you just come on to Made Absolutely. Remote. Yes. I would rather do that any day. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to get a mug the other day. Oh, no. <laughs> and I kid you not. So she has these the most gorgeous rainbow mugs hand painted. And of course, you know, Color Crush Creative, my co-brand, my art making brand is all about color and rainbows and everything fun and playful. And I'm like, well, I have to get a couple of these. <clears throat> yeah three minutes yeah. to check out and I still couldn't get one. Oh no yeah <laughs> if that was your first try I tell people that it takes like at least a couple goes at it because the first one you're just like yeah this will be fine this is normal I've done this before and then before you know it like you reach for your credit card and all of them are gone and then the second time you're like a little bit more prepared for it so you like have everything in front of you you know and sometimes even on the second attempt it doesn't work but yeah, these mugs, man, they really have a life of their own. Yeah. How many do you do each time you do a release? It depends. I'll do anywhere from like 20 to 60, okay. but I obviously the fewer I offer, like the more people get mad. My whole thought was like, because they're pre-order, they're totally custom. You get to pick your colors, you know, you get to pick what goes on the bottom and everything. There's no time for that. There's yes. no time for that. Just get them up. Yes. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, if I offer 20, then I can get them out super quickly. And then I can have another one, another sale, like really soon, but then people get so upset. So I tend to bog myself down and do more like 50 mugs at a time and then of course it takes me longer to get those out so it's it's really like no one is happy in in any situation but yeah this year I'll have to I need to do the math but I think by September on this next sale I have I'll have reached my thousandth rainbow mug that is so awesome I love yes. it yes Where I do like too so for me, I've seen this happen with other brands before. Sometimes it's with artists with painting. Sometimes it's with beautiful ceramics. Sometimes it's with jewelry where you've built up enough of a following and a system for yourself that you have these limited releases and they always sell out. Now, I know on the customer's end, it's frustrating. It's like, I really, really did want a rainbow mug, no doubt about it. But I also, from a uh, a business owner's point of view, understand this is what you have to do in order to create systems for yourself. You can't, you're not a machine. It's not like you can just make a thousand of them in one each sitting, mm -hmm. right? Unless you were to outsource I it, wish. it would yeah. no longer be exciting, right? <laughs> right. So 
I, and I remember experiencing it way back in the 2000s when I had the subscription kit and they would sell out of all the extra stuff like this fast. And people will be mad at the company and I'm sure you get all kinds of, of hate, hate mail of even, mm. I don't, I hope it's not mean, but like angry people, but they don't mm. realize twofold. And one is that you're a human trying to manage a human business that's creative. And on two on that is congratulations on building a following that you sell out every single time within a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is never what I like thought could happen. I mean, I think three years ago when I started offering these things, it was never like, I just didn't expect it to happen basically. And, and I do get like my fair share of, you know, rude messages, but I have truly trained my audience to not do that anymore. Like I, something happened January of last year where my website, like, like people truly broke my website trying to get a mug and, and it like, I, I won't get into the details about it, but no one was able to get one. And so for like a few minutes, everyone's freaking out, freaking out. And I, I don't know anything's wrong until, you know, a few minutes in, and then I have to kind of stop, fix everything, make it go back on. But in like three minutes of the website breaking, I received just a massive amount of messages and emails of people being frustrated, angry, mad, like what's happening. I'm trying to get this thing. And it broke me. Like I went quiet for like a week on Instagram, which for me is unheard of. I mean, I may as well have just like moved into a cave, but it soured the whole thing for me. And I have really slowed down since then. I'm off topic a little bit here, but it's crazy that something that is just supposed to be joyful and fun, and of course, make me money can bring out the worst in some people. So since then, I have really been upfront about like, if you don't get a mug this round, call your mom, call your boyfriend, call your sister, complain to them. Do not bring it to me right. because I don't have that kind of space. And, and you're right. Like no one is saying, congratulations. That's amazing. Everyone's just pissed that they didn't get one. So it really kind of like knocks the wind out of my sails. And I, I've been really, really upfront about that over the past year or so. And I, I do notice it helps to have those boundaries, but yeah, I never expected this to happen. I noticed you were setting those boundaries too, which I was like, so impressed with They're, that you forewarning, it's not easy, but eventually you'll get it. I have many customers who have, please don't complain. This is the system. This is the best I can do. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if it was open all the time, then well, one, you, you could either not keep up with it or I want to point out another point of view, which because majority of the people, hopefully who are listening to this podcast are listening because they want to improve their business and they're coming up with new ideas. And we're really like focused on that, that forward movement with our business. Think about how creating that hype around it in a lot of ways is helping grow your business as well. Totally. We can all only dream of being in a position where we sell out every time. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And they become like collector's items, you know, and like, right. and if you are a person that has, t you know, tried three times to get it and you finally get it, you're like elated and that joy, then you're probably going to tell someone about it. And then they're going to hear about you for the first time and then go through the process. And so like, I mean, truly my business has grown because of word of mouth, because of this, right. I've never, I don't do like targeted ads. I don't do anything like that. It's truly just like my audience sharing with their audience. But also they're really cute mugs. Well, that does help, thankfully. It does help. <laughs> you're talented. You've got something that's really fun and playful. And the whole spirit of how you've built your business is fun and playful. You see it and how you show up. Um, so many things you say are just so humorous. And back <laughs> to threads, it's like I get to see an even different side <laughs> of, of Amy. And it's like, would I ever be that brave to just share who I am. But I think that works so well for you because I I personally find it endearing. Maybe other people are turned off, but that's the whole point of mm -hmm. how we do social media marketing. Repel the people who are not interested, attract the people who are, and then you'll have more people energetically aligned to what you're doing. Totally. Yeah. And I, you know, I was looking for something last night in my stories archive on Instagram. And I noticed like, before 
my audience grew a little bit more, I was being so much more unhinged on stories. And like, I have always had a really dedicated audience and my engagement, my messages are crazy. Like my engagement is high one, because I'm on the app and I use it, you know, you right. can't have engagement without putting stuff out. But yeah, I used to post the craziest stuff and so much stuff. And I have kind of stopped doing that because I am having a hard time with the constant feedback of people lately. I feel like it's gotten a little bit worse. I feel like the TikTok of it all is giving people permission. They think they have permission to just say whatever they want to really? use. And it, and it makes me feel a little bit weird. And so I, I pull back a lot, but I have noticed on threads, I'm like being the more unhinged version that I used to be on story. And I, I would right. like to kind of marry them together because we don't know how long threads is going to last. Like you were saying earlier, like by the time this comes out, people could be like, oh my God, I can't believe we're talking about threads, but I'm enjoying that space while also forgetting that people can still see it. And that <laughs> is truly how I used to treat my Instagram. Like, like, I was treating it like nobody was watching. It was my own reality show for my entertainment alone. Um, and that really works for my followers. They really like that. And and it helps because it's just me. If I had a business partner, I think they'd be like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah. What about your partner I mean, partner? Is she? You know, she's fine with it. She, at first, I, I started my Instagram account in like 2016 and really nobody was was here or paying attention. And back then she was very much like, don't post, you know, videos of me. Like she, she was like worried about how she looked and everything. And now like the other day she got recognized somewhere without me and she wow. came home and was like, that? someone saw me and they, they said hi. And, and so now I think she kind of likes it, but she would never fully admit to it, you know, but I think she likes being adored. I I joke all the time, like my followers are only still here for Elaine, my girlfriend, and Jace, one of my nephews, who's like, he's the craziest 10 year old you've ever met. Yeah, they're not here for me. They're they're here for my family, basically. That's super awesome. But although I think they're there for you too. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. So then what's cool about what you do is yes, you're a maker, like most of us who somehow end up with a business involved with it, but yeah. you also support other makers. So I actually want to talk more about that part and really thinking about the business side of things and, and how you think outside of the box, including your marketing and, you know, how to have some of that bravery around showing up. Like I personally, I'm like, if you see me from the shoulders up only, it's because I still have all this self-conscious body image. I have a messy studio, so I'm never showing off my cute studio, right? Like, so I'm always like still predetermining and trying to yeah, control. control it. And I know that that doesn't help anything because there's so many sides of me that I haven't shown up as online. I'd love to hear like, how you get to that point and then what kind of advice? Cause I know you have Instagram audits and things like that. Yeah. I started working from home at my previous job and I had gone from like working in a studio, having coworkers, like being around people all the time, customers all the time. And then my position shifted and it was easier for me to work at home. And I started getting so lonely and I couldn't call my girlfriend every five minutes to be like, listen to this funny thought that I have. And so I just turned to Instagram stories. They had like just come out and I was truly back then I was talking like face to camera for probably like seven minutes of content, like a day at a time. <laughs> and so like, you know, the people that were watching, they were dedicated and they liked it and they enjoyed it. I can't imagine it was that many, but I really got past the self-consciousness of it all. And maybe that's because I was okay with how I looked back then. I've certainly gone like ebbed and flowed, you know, of how self-conscious I am kind of about my appearance. But I mean, at the end of the day, I would rather see your messy studio and I would rather see you show up than nothing. And I know people that are in the Instagram space and like, you know, they're on their camera and they're being like, oh, I have to fix my hair ahead of time. And like they spend 15 seconds of a story being like, oh, I just look so bad and my hair is a mess and my lipstick is over here. And it's like, if you had not pointed that out, we, oh, we would not know, you know? And so, and I kind of move through the world in that way of, we don't have to be like, you look crazy or, you know, you don't have to announce every bad thing that's ever happened. Um, 
when you show up. And so I just kind of got used to just being like, this is it. You know, if you like it, amazing. And if you don't, then, then that's okay. Normalize like, I probably don't it. like you. Yeah. Just yeah. Normalize it. Totally. And sometimes there are times where like, I get a little frustrated on the internet in terms of sharing, because when you're a person that shares volume a lot, people or your aud audience assumes that you're sharing every moment of your day and you know that there's nothing that you keep secret and it's like that's just not the truth like just because right. you're seeing me often doesn't mean that like you know about like health of family members or this stressful thing I'm going through in my personal life like and that's just something that kind of bothers me, you know, when people are like, oh, you're just always talking on the internet. And it's like, I'm really not just because you're seeing me a few times a day doesn't mean that I'm always here. Seven minutes. That was seven minutes of an entire <laughs> 24 hour period. Totally, totally, totally. Right. I've shown you little clips of what it is, not yeah. the whole picture. But yeah. that that was something that I was actually having a conversation with someone for a podcast before this is that when we share enough, we connect enough. And sometimes on our longer video formats or podcast or whatever, people start feeling like they're part of your world. And in some ways, that, yes. like you can have some feedback of that. But also those who want to be part of it are more likely to invest in who you are, what you're offering, the things that you sell and follow along for the journey because they feel closer to you. So it's a risk, mm -hmm. sure. But in the long run, it's a I think it's a risk worth taking. I agree. And I'm certainly still trying to figure out the like balance between that because some of my best customers are some of the most annoying followers that I have. And <laughs> they often cross the line with me because they think we're best friends. They know what I had for dinner. Therefore we're best friends, but I don't know anything about them. And there are some days where I can really let that go and I can be like, Oh, it's, I understand parasocial relationships. And there are other days where I'm like, one little comment will just make me insane. But I don't ever, I'm a person that doesn't want to like yuck someone's yum. And especially if you've been a huge customer of mine and you owe, and you own, own my God, 20 of my pieces and you say something to me that you think is a joke and I, and I'm having a bad day and I take it not as a joke and I snap back at you. You have 20 pieces around your house to remind you of that moment that we had. And I don't want right. to do that to anybody. Right. I try to stay very aware of that and truly just log off if I'm feeling annoyed or like I have learned the power of not responding or just double tapping a like. I, I used to give so much of myself yeah. to people and I, I just am learning how not to do that as much anymore. Right. I mean, we're going to get some feedback. We're going to get some pushback and the yeah. best thing we can do. I'm telling you, you know, those long emails you write and you're like, delete. Yeah, totally. Sometimes I don't even respond. And sometimes it's like, okay, here. And yeah. I actually hired somebody to answer all my emails. So I no longer have to deal with most of that. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's pretty kind, but I don't think I'm taking as many risks as you do. So you know, yeah. it's a big challenge, but I see that it works for you in the sense that honestly, for me, it's a relief in a whole sea full of the same, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like this circle of content that just keeps like, it's all the same. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's all the same. So it's like taking that risk means you stand out, but it also means you get to build a business because of it. Yeah. So are you 100% full-time mm -hmm. on your own business? How long have you been doing that? So I got laid off <laughs> of a company that I had spent almost 10 years at in 2019, August of 2019. And I spent a month or two kind of floundering about that and being like, what is my itinerary? What do I do? And I pretty much like December of 2019 went off on my own and have been full time for myself since March. I mean, a lot of that is because the pandemic hit and I mean, we had how, no choice. How wonderful you were already poised to be taking care of yourself. Totally. And I, you know, honestly, the pandemic was the best professional move. Of course, it was like high anxiety and like panicky all the time and made a lot of things very hard, but I was forced to build a business or, or not necessarily. I had always wanted to build the business. I had the idea 
but I finally had the time to do it. Right. So it I you. totally, and like, I laugh sometimes because people are like, oh yeah, they think about like early pandemic. They're like, oh, I watched like 15 movies a day and they, I watched that during the pandemic, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, I missed all of that. Like I made a Me few too. rounds of sourdough bread and then the rest was just working. I was working so much, but it was great. Yeah. I've been full-time since then. I mean, I kind of feel that same way too, where it's like, yeah, fortunately during 2020, I didn't have all the other obligations. And for some reason, I still managed to watch Tiger King and I regret it completely. <laughs> but that was about nice. the only trend thing that I got onto because the rest of the time I was showing up for my business. Totally. And it was a golden peak for everyone who came online, saw success. And even 2021 was pretty easy, but then 2022 comes. And now it's like, Okay, so what's happening? That was a good rush. And we had all these people who came online to build a business. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, but wait a minute, was like easy then. I'm like, well, it's time to actually learn. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm actually like 2022 was a very difficult year for me business wise. Like I made some moves for myself that I thought would help me. Like I closed programs because I was feeling overwhelmed and now I'm like, oh, that's income that I was guaranteed monthly. And now I don't have it. And I pushed back on some contract work that I had, you know, in 2022 and they canceled the contract entirely. So then I took a huge hit. And so it's, it's been like, you know, since I was uh, about a year, it's been sort of like, oh, things are different and hard. And I have not recovered from mm. the moves. And, and you're right. Like, thinking back to 2020 and 2021, I'm like, oh, what a sweet time. Everything was so much easier. Like, yes, I was working quadruple the amount I'm working now, but man, was it a time where it felt easy. Right. But then we realized, and like for me, I just, I hit a wall because I was working so mm -hmm. much. And so totally. we're trying to figure out now how to balance actually being a normal human and running a business. And I think that there was some burnout from that. And I'm just barely starting to recover from it now, mm -hmm. three years later. <laughs> yeah, totally. But Absolutely. it's like trying to figure out where is that happy balance between making a healthy income and not killing ourselves doing it. Totally. And I, you know, building this business in the pandemic where I had endless amount of time and, and nothing else to do, I created a level of working that I have no longer been able to meet. And, and then mm -hmm. I start to feel bad because I'm like the output I was able to do three years ago was so much higher than what I'm able to do now. So then I feel like I'm lazy or I feel like I'm a failure and, you know, that I could be doing more constantly and I can't, you know, it's like things are not the same. Right. And society for some reason has decided to equal our worth and value with productivity. <laughs> yes. Yes. So and I, and we... I've always been like that. Always. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly that kind of personality as well. So how do we balance it then? Let me know when you find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you that the first thing that has helped is hiring the right people to help me. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to grow better because of that, because I'm not doing the things that I don't need to do. I mean, the only thing like, sure, maybe you could even probably outsource the painting, but then it wouldn't be as as sweet yeah. for us. But there are parts like, that I can I am offer. making my own art, but like, I don't have to answer my emails, mm. you know, so there's some space for me to have a little more energy for only the things that I can do. And I don't know, I'm still really determined and passionate to get there, you know? Yeah. There are some days where I'm like, what if I get a job at Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah because like, at the end of the day you're not still thinking about Starbucks totally right? that's yeah the thing with being an entrepreneur you're always still thinking about it I know like, I don't know I'm not very employable at this point because I I'm not either much I'm not either back. <laughs> I know I know what a hole we have dug ourselves into well it seems like one thing that you've done that makes sense in order to sustain a certain kind of income without always having to produce a product, a physical product, is you're really helping people with their paint your own pottery businesses. Am I correct in understanding what your y'all stars? Yes. Yes. About? I, yeah. And I'm happy to explain that. I started out in the paint your own pottery space, that industry. I'm from a super small town in Georgia. I had never heard what that was. And I moved to Atlanta and like was looking for something fun to do and and 
found the studio and I was like, oh, this is so cool. I have never done this before. And then in college kind of needed a job and they were hiring and I had done like ceramics in college. And so I was like, cool, this will be a nice like creative thing. You know, you think like art job. And then at the end of the day, it's like, oh, this is a customer service cleaning job. It's not the same thing. But yeah, I was there for 10 years before they said, um, we're going to let you go. And I just became so passionate about like this crazy medium that has been so guarded for so long. You know, I, I, the ceramics world can be a confusing place because it goes through chemistry. Like sometimes people are like, how does that work? And I'm like, I don't know, science, and then just move on from there. But yeah, I wanted to stay in the space after I was let go from that job because I'd really made a name for myself in the industry. It's a relatively small industry across the world. There's probably only 600 studios. So we're a pretty tiny place. And I started creating these lesson plans essentially, because a lot of these studios want to do events, but maybe they don't have the time to figure out like what's trendy or make a project or figure out what their customers like. So that's what I supply with my Y'all Stars PYOP club subscription service. It's a monthly thing and they get like a little lesson plan every month and marketing materials and all that stuff. And it, that has been really good for me. That's amazing. Like thinking outside of the box is what I'm all about with business is, and especially when you have an information sort of based business that, that, that can couple with your like actual making art and selling art, right? Because totally. sometimes we don't really want to give up that part of us, but how many mugs can you make? As you say, you exactly. might be coming to a thousand, but a thousand is still like, unless was, you put it into mass production from China, it's never going to be the million dollar maker, yes, right? Yes. And those thousand were blood, sweat, and tears. And so right. I am constantly looking for like, you know, like you said, things that are not me sitting down and painting one dish, you know, and, and trying to do that a thousand times. So that's been really good. I also design um, bisque wear. So people that are not in this mm -hmm. space, bisque is pottery that's been fired once and is ready to be glazed. So when you walk into a paint your own pottery studio and you just see walls of white pottery, that's matte and just sitting yeah. there ready for you to paint. So I design shapes. I have like a designer line with this company that I work with. They manufacture the, those shapes and they get sent around to studios all over the world, which is amazing. So I get like royalties from that. That has been an incredible source of income for me because that's another like thing. I'm not having to sit down and try to make <laughs> every that's single fun. day. Yeah, yeah. So that's been great. I love that then there's so many different ways to connect back to what you do and what you learn through 10 years of working in the industry in the first place. You also provide like color guides and all kinds of like really great resources. Plus you help with the marketing. And I like that idea is you're not just giving them the idea that they're going to be able to teach their students and their paint your own pottery class, right? Mm -hmm. But actual marketing material that they can put on their social media or totally. hang in their window or whatever that they need to do. And I hope that what this is, is triggering for a lot of people in the audience, like those who are, those are our listeners who are thinking, what is my next move with my business? I'm an expert at creating this particular thing. How can I take it to the next level where I can make it a repeatable process for someone else? And this is just like, so many different things we don't think about providing advertisement for someone mm -hmm. else, providing licensing ideas for someone else to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that you've really built an all, all encompassing kind of viewpoint for that business. Plus you also like to help people with their social media. Yes. Yeah. I love, I've started doing Instagram audits this year, I think, which is crazy. Cause I, I mean, I've done so many at this point. But it's fun for me. Like it feels like a puzzle. I'm basically going to their Instagram account and telling them what to fix based on like goals they've given me and struggles that they've told me that they have and like who they're hoping to attract, you know, as a customer. And that has been so, so fun. I'm really loving that. Do you have some tips and tricks about what's like working with social media right now? Or is it the age old adage, just be yourself? <laughs> Well, uh, my, my very harsh advice is that it's not the algorithm's fault ever. It's yes. actually your fault. 
Yes. Nobody thank likes you. to hear that. I, but I'm, it's I'm jumping on that bad wagon with you. We have yeah, to say it's um, about the algorithm. Yes. And I think people forget that social media is a conversation and you have to treat it that way. And sometimes that means that you need to provide more context so that your customers understand what you're even talking about. I think we mm. get so close to our own work and our own industry that we forget that if we want someone else that's new to come in, they might not know what you're talking about. Like for me, you know, there's a lot of the world that has no idea what a kiln is and they're calling it an oven or they're calling it like a kennel or a Kindle or something. And it's my responsibility if I want you to fully understand how valuable my pieces are is to show you that this gets fired you know, up to a certain degree and it takes this long. And then after that, we have to process it in this way. Mm -hmm. So I'm really big on context. And I'm also just really big on paying attention to what you're doing. Like, what is the point of what you're putting out? Are you putting out a video that you have half thought through because quote unquote, the algorithm likes videos or right. is it something that your audience is finding value in? You know, I think people get so bogged down. I'm like, well, I have to show up in this space and they're just producing stuff for the sake of producing when it, it can still be fun. It's supposed yeah. to be fun. Right. But if you do a song and dance, but your audience that they're not interested in song and dance. What well, I don't know many artists who are willing to do song and dance, but this is hypothetically. Totally. It's like, then sure, great. You had something go viral, but it's not even the audience that you were intending it for. A thousand percent. I have a good friend of mine and she does similar things as me. She works with ceramics. Her niche is like cactuses. That's where she has sold a ton of cactus. And she does a lot of dancing on her Instagram and I love her to death and she finds so much joy in, in it. But like she's had a couple videos reach a million views of her dancing with her cute little college employees. And what's she getting from it? I can't imagine it's sales. Like I'm seeing a lot of mean comments pop up and that's not worth it to me. I'm like so anti going viral, you know, like <laughs> I can't sustain it. If I were to hit a million views on a rainbow mug tomorrow, and then I start getting thousands of new customers and not that like that can even happen, but if that in the perfect world, that's what would happen. I can't sustain that. I'm not, right. I'm just one person. Right. Well, you could probably sustain it if people wanted to join your membership and learn the whole paint your own pottery. Right. Um, but again, there's only like so many studios in the world, literally. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting, like the, the internet of it all. And I'm definitely just a big fan of like fostering relationships with the audience that you have and being yeah. welcoming for new people when they do come in. Right. Absolutely. I love that. And when the algorithm and your post tanks, it's because you've been saying the same monotonous thing a totally. million times and everyone's over it and the algorithm is really the people who are following you aren't interested in what you're saying anymore it's just a hundred percent a hundred and I've I've fallen victim to that how many times do people want to hear me promote my courses or my offers they get tired of it after a while which is one of the reasons I took a nice break this summer is because I'm like oh no I'm in the content circle of death at this mm. point. <laughs> I hear you, but also like I, something I tell people all the time in my audits is like, if you change the way you're talking about it just a little bit or like mm -hmm. diversify how you're showing it, it becomes a lot less like, oh, it's me again. And I'm talking about this one thing again, but it, it takes time and planning and strategy. And sometimes, you know, when we've just built the course or we've finished painting a whole round of things for sale, like you just don't have that kind of energy. So I, I totally right. get it. I'm a big fan of like, do what you can. And that's and the flip of it. Yeah. yeah. Do what you can, but each time learn and iterate from that. Totally. Yeah. But, you know, I like what you're saying. The most important part is, is show up for the people who are already there. So were you always creative? What did you go to school for? I have always been creative. I went to school. <laughs> this is so funny. I went to school for, I was going to be a painter. I grew up oil painting. I started oil painting when I was seven years old. And I thought, I'm just going to do that because I was good at it. I grew up in a small town, you know, <laughs> when you're like, have the least bit of talent. Everyone's like, you're incredible. And then I got to college and they're like, you're average. And I was like, oh, this is difficult for me. And 
I got a couple semesters in and was like, oh, this path is probably not like the smartest. So I switched to art education with a concentration on drawing, painting, and printmaking. If my girlfriend was here, she'd be making fun of me because I can't just be like, oh, I have a BFA in art education. And I always have to tell you the concentration right. because I paid, I paid for it. And so you're going to hear it. And when I called my dad to be like, yeah, I've changed my majors instead of just being a regular, like, you know, I'm going to be a painter. I'm, I'm just going to be an art teacher. And my dad goes, oh, okay, well, I think that's a great idea. I mean, we can't all be millionaires. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, realistic. Got it. He knows I'm not going to make any money. And I went through that and I, I did my student teaching. And when I graduated, it came time for me to like start applying to schools and stuff. And uh, the pottery studio I worked for, they were very manipulative and they were like, well, you don't want to do that. And, you know, I'm 21, 22. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to do that. And they're like, yeah, you want to stay here and develop like classes and courses for us. And I was like, okay, yeah, I want to do that. So I like built these things from the ground up. That's not what you asked me, but um, I no, did. No, that's a important. That's <laughs> a very important like pathway. Yes. So I did a, a ton of teaching for kids, for adults, for about like on and off for eight years. And I still do a ton of teaching in my industry. Next month, we have our big convention for the industry. I, I'm going, I'm teaching four classes and doing like speaking engagements and mm. stuff. And I love it. Like I come alive truly. When you hand me a microphone, I'm like in my, in my, like where I'm supposed to be, you know, like in my heart, I'm like a pop star without that sort of talent. I, I mean, as a kid, I was like super, super shy, but always like, I loved lettering as a kid. I remember I had like, you know, back in the nineties when like the craft books were so popular, I had all of those. And I had like a lettering book I was obsessed with. I was always the one that was like making the signs for my friends in middle school that said like, you know, Amy loves Jeremy. He did not love me back, but I was like really good at making those like cute little lettered signs and stuff. And was always just like a painter. I've just loved, I love paint. Like I love any medium Truly, like even the ones I'm kind of bad at, but I, I was never really good at sports. So I was always just defaulted into the art thing. Now what's this Amy loves Jeremy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Jeremy was my uh, middle school crush up until like high school. But like, you know, in middle school, it was like huge for us to have. But <laughs> I'm like really kind of speaking about a certain type of person at a certain age in our binders. I feel like right. the first like 15 pages were like absolute signs that your friends make you know and mine always said Amy loves Jeremy even though he didn't love me back oh fine well tell me a little bit about the path to having a girlfriend and if mm -hmm. being from a small town made a difference yeah I think so I mean I didn't know I was queer until I met my girlfriend, Elaine. I dated men. I was in a very serious relationship when she and I met. And I was like, oh no, I like this person in a way that I have never liked a girl before. And it was a similar situation for her. I resisted it for a long time because I didn't understand it. And mm -hmm. in my small town, obviously there were queer people they were gay people but we just sort of didn't talk about it kind of thing mm -hmm. and I didn't know how my family was gonna react so I would say for like almost three years I was like let's not like you can kind of resist this it's just a one-off thing it's not worth pursuing but I truly could not stay away from Elaine that's my girlfriend and finally broke up with my ex-boyfriend and she and I, you know, we were never like secret, you know, after I broke up with my boyfriend, but I just sort of wasn't talking about it. And she would come home with me and it was very much like roommate vibes, you know? And finally my dad was like, you guys aren't just friends. Right. And that's like the conversation we had, like he very much kind of outed me in that way. And I was like, no, we're not. And it was tough. And this was like, man, at this point, it was probably seven years ago. And it, it was hard. It was really hard because I felt like I, I don't like to be misunderstood or misrepresented. That is something that really bothers me. And so I'm just trying to tell my whole family, like, I'm still the same person. I haven't been hiding anything from you. 
you're figuring out like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like at the same time as me, I'm just the same person. And so that was really tough. And now of course, everything's totally fine. And they love Elaine. Elaine's family is super supportive. So it's been easy in the long run, but I can't imagine like if I had realized at a younger age, it feels like that would have been very difficult. I was probably in some way protecting myself a little bit because I knew it was like not the time that that could have happened. And I, you know, I've, I've been with Elaine forever and with my own sexuality, I'm like, some days I identify as lesbian, other days I identify as bisexual. I don't necessarily need a like label anymore. It was really, really important to me in the <clears> beginning. And I see like, as I get older and like move through this relationship and the world, it doesn't bother me. Like I'll take whatever. <laughs> I'm yeah, whoever. The, you know what the I mean? label thing has been really interesting to me as well. And I love that in all honesty, because I watch my kids going through high school and then in their early oh. years where it's not an issue for them, non-issue. It's not even there. There's no blip. One of their friends came out trend, trans the other day and they're like, good for her, right? Mm -hmm. Good for her. And I'm totally. like, I love that their generation, which they're a little bit younger than you, but you know, mm -hmm. their generation is just like non-issue. And mm -hmm. I know now that sexuality is fluid and it's a spectrum right totally. it's not yeah. so black and white as the world wants to make it and I think that's probably where we're getting all of these like friction and, and heart felt hurts yeah people but when you step back to see it it's seriously a non-issue it's yeah, people a non -issue. I people get so afraid and that was kind of the response I got from my parents I mean my my mom doesn't care you know at, at the end of the day she's just like include me. Like, I just want to know what's going on. Like, you know, she right. just wants to kind of be friends, but my dad was just like, you know, he asked me, are you going to be like this forever? And at the time I was like, so hurt by that because it was like, oh. cause I know I'm just me, you know? So yes, I am going to continue to be me forever. Right. But he, you know, it, it's just this fear of like, is her life going to be harder? Like, what mm -hmm. does everything look like? And yes, there are things that are more difficult. I'm the age now where a lot of my friends are having children. And I was just having this conversation this weekend. Like I always, from a teenage age, assumed I would just accidentally get pregnant one day. Like <laughs> I never thought about yeah, well, like- Some of us did. So. Totally. And I just assumed, you know, that it was just going to happen. And like, if I had never met Elaine, I'd probably be married to my stupid ex-boyfriend. And thank God I'm not, but- you know, I'd be married to him. I'd have a couple kids and that would be fine. But now with her, if we want to have children, it's such a choice and it's such a journey. And like, then it becomes very expensive. And then it becomes, do we do IVF? Do we adopt? Do we whatever? So it's, the, it just becomes not easy anymore. Right. So I don't know if that's a choice that I want to make. I'm 33 years old. I, I don't feel like the clock is crazy ticking but it will be eventually and like yeah will I want to I I don't know it's very strange so let's tie it to business just a little bit and current times where I feel like we're at a weird pivot point where being queer should be a non-issue it's not for some people we've taken like 100 steps back mm -hmm. I watched this massive progress and then all of a sudden it's like with progress, you're going to have the pendulum swing the other way. How does it affect your business or is it a non-issue with your business? You know, that's an interesting question because I'm curious, like how much I'm just not kind of paying attention to. I do notice some people when they share me with their audience, they make a point to say like queer woman artists, like, and they kind of lead with that, but I don't necessarily do that in my own kind of marketing. Yeah. And it's not because I don't think it's valuable because I do think it's very valuable. I'm about to say two very different things. So one, I'm just showing up as myself, just like we're saying, I'm just right. like, this is me. Like I just happen to be queer, like whatever in other spaces, I am not queer enough. And like, I feel very much like not like in the way that I can't wear the badge back in June, I did a queer artist market. And if you just lined us all up, and you were like, which one of these people are straight? They'd be like her and point to me because I just like look 
not the part and I know that's so crazy to say and like there are some people that are just like switched off the podcast right now and that's not what I mean I don't think like you have to look a certain way to be queer but if there are some spaces where I feel like oh you just look like you could be like heteronormative or you have passing privilege in that way and that makes me feel a little self-conscious and maybe like that that's the only time between two worlds a little bit yeah like very much just sort of feeling weird and then I think they hear that I've had an ex-boyfriend and they're like oh okay (laughs) And, and of course that is like definitely my own insecurity coming out to play and everyone is so nice and so welcoming and no one would ever be like you're not queer enough to be here but yeah there are certainly some places where I feel like I feel weird about leading with like, I'm queer, you know, but. Well, but don't we get tired of tokenizing everything? Totally. I think that's, and maybe this is wrong on me and I have some growth to do, but you know, I really tried to stand up during Black Lives Matter, but then it became like, we have to have Black people on during Black History Month and we have to have gay people on during Pride Month. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we are just like making a, almost making a parade of different yeah. things like and not just respecting them all year long right yeah. so I'm not good at falling into the whole I guess tokenizing is the best way to say it I just want it to be all the time I right? know it does it gets so embarrassing like when February rolls around or when it's like pride month and people are sharing like people who never ever talk about it start sharing right. like the same meme over and over again it's just like what is this for what is the point who is this for is this making you feel better like uh, Mm -hmm. it's just it's very tricky it is and I will say I've lost followers because I've stood up for Black Lives Matter especially in 2020 when it was really seriously highlighted Mm -hmm. but it's still a serious problem even today and I won't ever back down from saying this is where I am I'm a very liberal liberal person so in fact, my kids kind of make fun of me because I kind of have a capitalist job and I'm like, well, capitalism mm-hmm. in and of itself from small makers is not the problem. Mm-hmm. And I definitely am still mindful of that. But I know that sometimes people are just like, nope, she's not for me. And you know what? I'd rather than think I agree. it's not yeah. for me. But I also yeah. don't want to be the kind of person who's just only flying the flags during the totally. month, or whatever it is. It just n- becomes a natural part of who I am and my mm-hmm. support. And I just tried to show up and show it, but maybe I still have a lot to learn because I don't know, you know, there's still so much for me to open up my heart and mind about, but at the same time, I'm trying to, and I know we've gone deep on the subject of being queer LGBTQ, but I, I think I wanted to have the discussion because I think that it is an issue that we have to pay attention to at this point. And in the end, can we be without labels in some ways? And that would be really kind of cool. I hear that and I don't disagree with that, but I mean, even hearing you say like, I'm glad we had this conversation because if I'm a listener and I'm queer and I'm also hearing in this conversation that like you're introducing me to another queer person, I'm like, nice. You know, like I'm always looking around and kind of feel a connection like when I do meet a new queer person. And so there is value in the label, but I think when it becomes your only defining factor that's where maybe the the problem is or maybe not that maybe there are some people that truly need that and want that and I think that's great that's not necessarily me I'm obsessed with myself (laughs) you know like I don't have to lead I want you to know me because I'm like talented and funny and like have occasionally good hair I don't care if you also know that I'm queer even though like you know right right I would like you to know well I agree, but can we put it like queer and artists? Like no Mm -hmm. one's like, you know, like the only label I'm going to say is I'm a mom, right? We wear so many hats. Right. So So like not everything has to be that far defined, but I do agree in order to make connections and feel like we're not alone, there is value in our identity. Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. So how about we take it full circle and just bring it back to business for a minute. They can find you at Amy, y'all. It is A-M-M-I-E, Y-A-L-L. You can find me at amyall.com, Amy Y'all on Instagram. I don't really use TikTok for business. I certainly try not to use Facebook for business. So that's kind of the two spots to find me. Oh, and make sure you find her on threads. 
Oh yes, that's true. Somebody actually followed me yesterday. They're like, I actually found you on threads. And I was like, oh God. I have quite a few that have too. I mean, I think there's still potential. Let's see where it goes. Yeah. I love the casualness of it. I love right. the the non perfect strategy of it, which makes mm -hmm. it really easy to use. I knew that there'd be a, a big growth and then a dip and we're only like a, not even a month into having thread. So I like to be able to have those conversations and I would really love to take some inspiration from you and just show up a little bit more of myself, Go a little for bit it. more of all aspects of who I am and even my messy studio or no hair or makeup days mm -hmm. and be comfortable. And I appreciate about you is just that you're showing aspects of your life that honestly make me feel more included and normal in a lot of ways, you know? That's great. I want to see it all. Basically when I connect with someone on the internet, I want to see your good days. I want to see your bad days. I want to see your just like boring days, you know, because it makes me feel like, oh, I have those too. Yeah. Yeah. We are. We're just human behind the screen trying to sell <laughs> our pottery and don't get mad at when it sells out in three minutes. Yes. Yeah. And my only advice to anyone that's listening that wants to start doing face to camera is please don't look at yourself while you're doing face to camera. Look into the camera. Oh, yeah. Not your Absolutely. eyes. I get so crazy when people are like very clearly looking at themselves while they're recording something. I'm like, no, right. look at the look camera. At the Good. Great. Right. I love it. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. Thank you. One more thing. I always yeah. ask and every now and then I forget to ask, but I don't want to forget to ask. What's your big audacious dream? <laughs> I want my own TV show. I used to skip school when I was a kid, when I knew that someone was coming on the Martha Stewart show that I really wanted to see. And I would fake sick so I could stay home and watch it. And I, I want to be the next Martha Stewart without the jail time but just like a TV show where I'm like, this is how you do everything. I am the authority. Well, all right. So y'all show, I go, mm -hmm. I'd watch that. I want to see how you make stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Okay. If you know anybody, please send them my way. Well, you can <laughs> at least start with YouTube and I'd be watching you there. That's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.